Welcome to Hull on Estates, a series of podcasts for the Canadian legal community dealing with issues and insights surrounding estate planning in Canada. Hosted by the lawyers of Hull and Hull, the podcast will touch on some key considerations when planning estates and wills. Now, here are today's hosts. Hello and welcome to Hall and Estates. You are listening to episode number 663. I'm Stuart Clark. And I'm Aaron Chan. Hello, Aaron. I think this is our, uh, our first podcast together. How are you doing today? I'm good. And yes, this is our first podcast together. I'm excited to have you here today. And I think we have, at least what I like to think, is kind of an interesting um, case that came out relatively recently, I believe, um, that kind of touches upon a, a topic that is, is kind of a, a good you know, it kind of makes your brain work a bit about through some trust concepts and where the court can and cannot intervene. And that's the idea of CPRE. Uh, and, you know, I'm sure we'll get into more detail here in a second, but CPRE for those who, you know, you know, want to know a very, very basic overview is the, is the, the legal doctrine or concept where the court has jurisdiction when a, when a charitable request fails in a will, they can step in and say, okay, well, you, you know, the, the, Quest was supposed to go to this charity, which for whatever reason we can't carry out, but we're instead going to give it to the similar charity over here. So the gift doesn't fail. We're going to allow this charitable intention to kind of shift to this other charity over here and have the bequest still carried out and have the testator's intentions carried out. And there's a new case that came out called DORS, uh, D-O-R-S versus Public Guardian Trustee 2023 ONSC 1503 that we want to talk about today. And then maybe Aaron, if you can give us a, a, a kind of a summary of, of what happened in this case. Sure. So the, the facts of this case aren't all that remarkable. Um, the state here was a modest one valued at about $660,000. Uh, the deceased here executed a will leaving 20% of the residue to a charity. And that charity ceased operations shortly after she executed her will. And the applicant estate trustees wanted to have the gift distributed to the other 19 named charities in her will on a pro rata basis. But the PGD here objected to that proposal and instead wanted to have that 20% paid to a charity with similar charitable objects under the CPRE doctrine. And the will didn't contain any further provision directing how the distribution of the residue uh, would be handled in that sort of an event. Uh, and so here, Justice Gilmore sided with the PGT uh, and she made a number of findings um, to apply the CPRE doctrine. Uh, number one, she found that the testator was a religious person. Number two, the testator continued to make donations to the charity throughout her lifetime. Number three, the portion of the bequest was the largest of all the charities, which seemed to imply that this charity um, was of particular importance to the deceased. Number four, the gift was made without limitation to a charity. Number five, there was no gift over in the event of a lapsed gift. And number six, the remaining residual beneficiaries are all charities. You know, thank you, Aaron. Yeah, and in this instance, so oh, spoiler alert, uh, Justice Gilmore eventually did find that the doctor's fee pray could be applied here and did shift the charitable quest to a, a new charity to be to be selected at a later date. But in doing so, it provides a great kind of summary of, of both the law surrounding C pray and also some of the considerations that go into the test for C pray. And, you know, very high level, the basic test as outlined in the case uh, for whether or not the court can invoke the CPRE doctrine is one, you know, so if there is a bequest to a charity in the will, you know, first part of the test is, is the gift in the will impractical or impossible for whatever reason? Um, two, uh, did the testator manifest what's called a general, ter- general charitable intention in making the gift? And three, is a gift to an alternative institution organization, no, sorry, it, would a gift to an alternative institution organization resembling the initial charity fulfill the uh, purpose of the gift in the will. Um, now, in this instance, I think the interesting part to kind of focus on, because kind of the biggest question in considering the applicability of CPRE is what is a general charitable intention, right? Because that's kind of the foundational part of, of the bequest. And you can kind of see how it can come into play here, right? So, in the, you know, when you make the bequest to, you know, a charity, a church, a hospital, a food bank, whatever the charity is, did you intend to benefit that specific charity or did you intend to benefit the wider charitable purpose that that charity would fulfill? And because I'm, I'm kind of, you know, old and cool, actually for this, I dusted off my old 
university or law school uh, trust textbook and went to the CPRE part of it. I'm just to kind of read through some of the top cases they talk about in CPRE. Uh, and I think it's a great kind of starting point in some of these discussions here. And kind of in the summary part here, and I have my, you know, for those who can see, you know, it's right here, but it's the, from the, the law of trust, the contextual approach, which is probably several editions out of date now because I am getting older and, and uh, you know, we'll call it wiser uh, with time. But in their kind of summary part of it, and say, you know, when considering whether or not there is a general charitable purpose that can be, you know, acted upon in the CPRA doctrine, the courts historically are more sympathetic to situations where the bequest to a charity, the name charity never actually existed. Because the theory there is, well, you're kind of intended to generally bequest a charity like that, rather than the difference of, you, you know, the charity did exist, but no longer exists because the passage of time, they've wound up whatever. Now, interestingly here, in the case that Justice uh, Gilmore just decided, that charity actually did stop to exist, but they still extended the CPR doctrine here. So it's not a hard or fast rule, obviously. And they kind of underline here in the text here, it's, it's, a, it's a rule of construction, right? I mean, it's, it's no different than any other will being interpreted. And that is, you're supposed to kind of, you know, ask yourself fundamentally, you are the court, you're asking, is there a charitable intention here? But well, what would the testator have wanted? Would they have wanted this money to go to a similar charity or would they have wanted to go to know that specific charity? You can think of examples, right? You worked for, or you, you went to a specific church for your whole life and for whatever reason that church no longer exists, but there's a one down the street that's kind of similar. Would you want the money to go to that? Or would you know you, you wanted to go to that specific church because that's the one you went to for your whole life? It's an interesting idea. And so, Within that, so in this textbook, they, they, they cite to a case from 1997 called Royal Trust Corporation of Canada versus Hospital for Sick Children. It's um, out of BC, 17 ETR 2D57. And now here, you know, oh, these are not my words, these are the words of the testator here, but they left a bequest in their will to quote unquote, the crippled children's hospital in Toronto. Obviously that's a term that you know we wouldn't use anymore. Um, and according to the case here, it was it was never used for a hospital in Toronto. It never was a, a hospital by that name operating in in Toronto. But the court said, "Well, wait a second. We can we can see that there's a general charitable intention here to probably benefit a hospital that would do similar purposes. Well, there are clearly hospitals in Toronto that do this, like the Hospital for Sick Children. We are going to step in here and allow that bequest to go to that children's hospital, so that this charitable intention can be still carried through." And so obviously in that entrance, they actually um, allowed it to continue, which is that, which I think is, 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 is great. But then, you know, at the same time, you can see circumstances maybe where they wouldn't extend that. And, you know, I mean, like that, I don't know, just showing how big of a, of a loser or nerd I am. But again, uh, I, when I was reading through these, you know, I, for some reason, my mind, as it often does, bounces back to um, Monty Python. And there's a, there's a part in, the, in, in Life of Brian where there's, there's a fight between the Judean people's front and the people's front of Judea. And you think, well, those are clearly the same thing. If you were gonna leave money to one, would you not, you know, if they cease to exist, would you want the money to go to the other? But if you remember the movie, they hated each other. They were both from, you know, similar things, but the whole concept was, you know, even though they, they had almost identical names, they don't, they didn't get along. And would you want, if you left money to one, would you want your money to go to the other? And that's where you can kind of see the question of the testator, you know, what would they have intended the court stepping in, in the shoes of the testator and saying, or armchair more, what the, what the case law says, sit in the armchair of the testator and say, what would they have wanted here? Would they have, if you left money to the Judean people's front, and for whatever reason, they stop existing, would you want it to go to the people's front of Judea? And the answer is, well, no, probably. And in that instance, it wasn't a terrible, general terrible intent, and therefore the gift should fail. So, so yeah. I think, um, so it's just on that point, Stuart, so I, I think it's, for those who aren't too familiar with the doctrine, I think it's easy, I guess, like on first blush to say that the most common sense, easiest thing is just, just do what the estate trustees in this case wanted to do. Like, why not just distribute the gift to the other name cherries? How, how are you able to distribute with any confidence um, a gift to a charity that was never named in the first place? And I think, so I, I think, Gilmore, uh, Justice Gilmore's decision here was right. I think it's a good reminder that, you know, at the end of the day, like the whole point of this is an exercise to figure out how you can best honor the wishes and the intentions of the testator. Um, and, and how do you honor the charitable purpose of the will, if there is any? 
No, exactly. And I think, Aaron, you touched upon something interesting here, which is who, I mean, obviously the problem here is these charities don't exist by their nature. Something's gone wrong along the way. So there's no one here that you can be like, hey, you know, charity doesn't exist anymore. Are you cool if we do X, Y, or Z? And if I do something wrong, is anyone going to sue me? So obviously this charity doesn't exist anymore. Who, how could they sue me if they don't exist anymore? And of course, the interesting, you know, kind of caveat here, and you see it here, even in the name style of cause here, which is the public guardian trustee, is that the office of the public guardian and trustee in Ontario has a general supervisory role over charities in Ontario. You have a lot of requirements when you're dealing with charities in the states to serve them, that to be served with passings of accounts, you have to put them on notice when there are requests to charities. And here, when you're trying to say, well, wait a second, I can't carry out this bequest to a charity, what should I do? The PGT steps in and says, wait a second, we're not going to let you just ignore this charitable intention. We want to make sure that if, if someone wanted to leave money to a charitable purpose, that if that can't be carried out for whatever reason, we're going to take that money and give it to something similar. So here the PGT obviously took an uh, adverse position to that of, of the, uh, you know, the state who wanted to distribute it to the other beneficiaries said, no, like, you can't do that. You need to find another charity. And ultimately one, right? I mean, I believe the end of the of the case here directs that they're to come up with a list of charities, right? They're supposed to work yeah, with each right. other and come up with a list of similar charities um, to the one that doesn't exist anymore for, for the children. It was just at South America, I believe, or something like that. The charity doesn't exist anymore. They couldn't find anymore. And then the executor in the end could pick from the list of charities who to give that money to. But it had to go to a charitable purpose, right? You can't just, you know, ignore it. And the PGT takes that role obviously very seriously here, right? They, they stepped in and they, they fought against the executors trying to do something else. Yeah, that's right. But it's, a, it's an interesting case. I think it's a great example. One, it shows that, you know, because even here, as I said, my textbook here, now granted it's, you know, older than I'd like to admit, so it may be out of date, but said that, you know, look, the court historically has been less sympathetic to invoke CPRE when it's just that the charity that did exist no longer exists because they assume you wanted to give it to that one. But it's not a hard and fast rule because the foundational element there is what would the testator have wanted? Rule of construction. They want to construct this will as if we were placing ourselves in the testator what they would wanted. And here on the facts, the court concluded um, that it was the testator's intention to generally benefit charities like this and therefore to invoke the doctrine. And I think that's a, a kind of a great, you know, kind of it's a great case to make you kind of think through the concepts. And also make you think through that, you know, it, this area is gray, it's mushy. There's no hard and fast rules here to, to work off of. And you always kind of have to look at every case on a case by case basis and ask found, found foundationally, and that's always the case in interpreting will, what did the test data want? And here the court concluded the test data wanted the money to go to a different charity. That's so right. yeah, I think that takes us to the end of the day. I said, really interesting case. We'll make sure the citation is up in the, the kind of, you know, blurb that goes along with our podcast here. Uh, Aaron, thank you for, for podcasting with me today. And until next time, uh, I'm Stuart Clark. And I'm Aaron Chen. And if you want to uh, get in touch with us, please feel free to email us at info at hallandhall.com or get in touch with us on your other means. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. This has been Hall on Estates with the lawyers of Hall and Hall. The podcast you have been listening to has been provided as an information service. It is a summary of current legal issues in estates and estate planning. It is not legal advice, and you are reminded to always talk with a legal professional regarding your specific circumstances. To listen to other podcasts or to leave a question or comment, please visit our website at hullandhull.com. Our theme music is Upper Structure by DJ A Kid and is courtesy of the Podsafe Music Network.